morning, and welcome everyone to the eighth annual Music Business Forum. My name is AJ Merlino, and I'm the Director of Music Industry Studies and an Associate Dean at Albright College. I'll be your host and moderator for this amazing event that features presentations from some of the entertainment industry's top executives who all just happen to be Albright College graduates. Before we get started, I'd like to thank all those who make this event possible every single year. That includes Albright College President Jackie Vetro, our Provost Karen Campbell, Center for the Arts Director David Tanner, Center for the Arts Administrative Assistant Christy Klein, Music Department Chair Jeff Lentz, and the entirety of the Music Department. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Trent Gray. Trent is the Box Office and Client Services Manager at ASM Richmond. He has enjoyed a four-year tenure with ASM Global and recently celebrated his one-year anniversary at the historic Altria Theater in Richmond, Virginia. Trent is a graduate of Albright College class of 2017 with a degree in music industry studies and arts administration. He has worked on numerous, numerous uh, performances with acts including Kevin Hart, Slayer, Mark Anthony, Tim Allen, Hosier, Sebastian Maniscalco, and Hamilton. In July of 2019, Trent was named a member of the 30 Under 30 Class of 2019 by the International Association of Venue Managers. Please help me welcome Trent Gray. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, AJ, for that incredible introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I was really excited, um, especially working on the forum in the past to have the opportunity to um, present. Um, I am a little heartbroken to in person, but I am um, extremely grateful for the opportunity and extremely excited to be here with you guys. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to um, start sharing my presentation here for you. All right, so uh, let's see a show. Uh, with me again, I'm Trent Gray, the box office and client service ma services manager of ASM Global. So let's meet Albright's golden child, um, the one that got away, according to A.J. Merlino. This is an exact quote I took from the New York Times. Um, well, my time at Albright, um, I was involved in Line Enterprises in a couple different capacities. Um, my favorite being the president um, of Line Enterprises. Um, and one of my favorite things was actually um, running the forum um, when we had it during my time. I was also heavily involved in WXAC um, as the music director there. Um, I would highly recommend um, if anyone here has not already reached out to uh, Mindy at WXAC um, to get involved. Um, my experience in time there, I really truly feel is one of the um, building blocks for my career. And what I've been able to achieve so far is, is having Mindy there and having that experience at WXAC. Um, she's been a great mentor to me, and I, I would really suggest everybody to kind of head over to WXCC and um, get the same experience I did. Uh, I also was a part of SGA during my time, which was an amazing thing, um, especially helped during with budgeting and finding out different um, allocation of resources, which really helped um, as I move forward. Um, and I had a couple different internships, um, one at WXAC and then one with SMG, um, which is now ASM Global. Um, which actually led into my career here. So I couldn't be more thankful for that. Um, my real world experience um, at SMG, at the Santander Arena and Santander Performing Arts Center right there in Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, I started out um, as an administrative assistant after my internship uh, and then turned into the box office supervisor, which is one of the um, part-time roles that is a part of a box office. And then um, I was actually took the role of assistant box office manager. And I had that for about two years before um, I uh, found out about an opportunity in Richmond, Virginia. So I then moved to uh, SMG Richmond. Um, and during my time at SMG Richmond is when the um, transition into ASM um, Global happened. Um, there I, am, I was the box office manager. And then in November, um, I moved into the box office and client services manager title. Um, I, again, I was named one of the 30 and the 30 in the class of 2019 by IAVM, which is the International Association of Venue Managers. Um, and recently, I was just awarded with the title of Best Cat Dad, which is um, my crowning achievement so far by my beautiful little cat, Dave. Um, so ASM Global, imagine the experience. Um, that is the company I work for. It is a management company. Um, so it's a company that manages venues. Um, so what is a management company and how does that work? So the 
the venue is owned by some sort of client or some sort of board um, in, a, in a basic sense. It's some form of entity. Um, in a lot of cases, it is a government entity or it's run by the local government, um, but those, those staff don't really know how to manage a building. Um, so that's where companies like ours, ASM Global, comes in to provide um, high-level professionals who can manage a building to make it um, a, a center for tourism, to bring entertainment to the, the local area, and of course, to make the endeavor profitable. So there is uh, the, first, the first scenario here, we have the board and the client, and they contract the management company to then run the building. Um, there is also another form this can take where it is a management company who actually owns stake in the building as well and then runs it too. There's a couple other different ways. Um, if it's there is no management company involved, say it's a private interest that owns the building itself and they run it um, with their staff. Um, these are the two main ways that a management company is actually involved. So SMG to ASM Global. Um, I hope it is something you guys have, have saw. It was one of the biggest mergers in the industry. It's where um, formerly we're at SMG, and we merged with, AS, uh, with AEG facilities um, to now form ASM Global. So it is the world's leading venue management and service company, and we focus on connecting people through the power of live experiences and events. Um, there's just some quick stats here. So there's 160 million um, guests hosted annually through ASM Global events. Um, we're on five different continents. Um, there's 61,000 staff members of ASM Global spread out amongst the world. Um, there is 23 million square feet of convention space um, because we do manage theaters, convention areas, stadiums, arenas, amphitheaters, everything really. Um, 2.7 million seats um, under our management um, as ASM Global. And then there are 300 plus venues that's in our portfolio and that is worldwide. So let's talk a little bit about the Santander Arena and the Santander Performing Arts Center, which is the, the one that's right in your backyard. Um, you guys are very fortunate to have um, a, a wonderful venue there in a great market in, in Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, so the first one here on top is the Santander Arena. Um, this is a, a beautiful shot. I love this. This was taken during my time there. Um, it is an amazing venue. It's uh, 7,000 plus capacity. Um, venue. So there's a bunch of different configurations can have. There's a bunch of different ways that the place can be set up, um, but it's a beautiful place to go. And there's also the Santander Performing Arts Center, which is about a 1700 plus capacity. Um, so you have a great 7000 plus seat venue there as well as a, a theater. Um, there also is the Reading Royals, which I'm sure you guys are aware of, um, and a lot of other really cool stuff that come in when you have a big building like that. So um, moving on to ASM Richmond, where I currently am. This is the Altria Theater. Um, it's a horse, historic Altria Theater um, in Richmond, Virginia. It is a, the capacity is 3,600. So it's about 3,600 seats. Um, and you can see the inside here. It's a beautiful three-tiered theater. It was originally um, a mosque. A lot of people used to know it as the mosque. Um, and that's a, a thing I've had to get used to here in, in Richmond, people calling it the mosque. Oh yeah, yeah I work at the Altria Theater, the, the mosque. Um, it's, it's a gorgeous space. Um, when I saw it, uh, I, I, first time I saw it in person, I was, I was, I was blown away by it. Um, it's a great house. We see a lot of business here. Um, our Broadway series is really successful and one of the, our driving forces. Um, we also run another building here, much like in, Rich, in Reading, where you have the Santander Arena and Santander Performing Arts Center. Um, we also run the Dominion Energy Center in ASM Richmond. Um, so Dominion Energy Center is about half the size. It's an 1800 capacity theater, um, and it is as well gorgeous. Um, this is the outside of it, and you can see the inside. Um, this is during a um, symphonic performance. Um, but the really cool thing about this venue is you can see that there's like kind of these clouds and stars up in the, in the sky. It was, it has a lot of really cool character and a lot of our guests here love to come and actually see shows at the Dominion Energy Center because of the, the cool character that it has. All right, so let's get inside the live event. Um, I want to do kind of just do a full overview of live events and how live events work before getting into my job and what ticketing is, because um, I do think it is kind of valuable just to understand how a live event functions. Um, so 
here are some terms that I have. Um, just I gave this presentation to someone who doesn't have much experience in the industry, and these are things that they wanted me to explain in the beginning. Um, and uh, so you guys may know some of these, but I just kind of wanted to um, touch on them really quickly. Also, I will use some more lingo that I may have forgot to put on here. If you have any questions about what I'm saying or what it means, please just point it out right away. Um, and I, I can explain to you what that term is. Um, so promoter is a company or person who is at risk for the performance. Um, sometimes I'll use house in, in place of the venue. Um, build is the process of creating a show in the ticketing system. Holds are seats that are held for specific purposes during the build process. Um, a cap is the capacity of the venue, like I've told you, the capacity of the Santo de Foreign Arts Center Arena and the Altria Theater and the Energy Center. Um, gross is the total amount of money that comes in and net is the, that amount of money less your expenses. And then risk is at stake. So if you're at risk, you have the opportunity to lose as well as gain, but that is just a basic of what risk means. So uh, I wanted to go over deals first, just a quick preview of booking. And I did have a quick disclaimer on this. Um, I'm going to show you the three main deals that everything is kind of based around. Um, no deal is the same. There, I have seen some come in that are straight like this, um, but there's usually a lot of exceptions and a lot of tweaks made here and there by the booking department. But this is the, these are the three fundamental deals that are kind of everything is based on as you move through when you're booking an event. This is also the BOK Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's a beautiful arena. If you guys are ever in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I would, could not recommend more grabbing a ticket to a show and, and checking out what's going on there. So the first main, um, main deal is a rental. So a rental, it, it's a, a straight deal where you have the promoter. So the promoter, again, is the person who's presenting the show and is at risk. Um, in my job, promoter is king. And this kind of really details it out. So you have the promoter at the top, they will actually have an outside deal with the talent or management or um, agent or whoever is directly representing the artist or talent, they will have an outside deal with them that usually us as a venue, we don't know about. They will then um, book a date and space in the venue um, and then we receive rent for that. Then we, uh, as the venue, facilitate a lot moving forward from there. Um, and ticketing is actually a positive income revenue. So that's where we get the, the whole revenue for the event. So we collect the ticketing revenue. Um, we then also have some expenses that go along with the show. And that's just standard for everything. I mean, the security, um, marketing, or some pretty basic expenses that, that come up when you're actually presenting a performance. Um, so then we will then remit those funds back to the promoter, um, less the expenses. So, and the deal snapshot at the bottom, I have your event income, your talent cost, and your venue rent and expenses, and then your promoter take. And everybody wants this to be as big as possible. So you wanna be able to pay your artists, pay all your expenses, and then the show um, nets way more above that. Um, and that's where the promoter's take comes in. So that's a, a, a straight rental. Um, there's also another option, which is a co-pro or a co-promotion. Um, this is where the venue is also going to be taking some risk as well. So we become a partner with the, the presenting promoter. So in this one, you have the promoter who reaches out and books with the agent um, and the talent. So that's a known deal that we know about. Um, we then collect the ticketing revenue. There's still the same expenses that, that occur during the show. And then the, the big difference here is we're able to split that with the promoter and the venue. So we have actually an opportunity to, um, we're at risk with it, so we are also at gain whenever we're able to get um, part of the, the net profits from that. So again, with the quick deal snapshot, you have the event income, minus the talent cost, minus the menu rent and expenses, and then you have the, the profit to split between the promoter and the venue. So for the third, the third um, kind of basic deal that you have in booking is going to be um, when the actually it's a presenting house when the house is presenting or it's, it's being self-promoted by the house so this is where we don't have a promoter who is at risk and we are fully at risk for that show so you have the venue where we buy the talent directly whether it be through the buying the agent the management however that may work we buy it with an internal deal that we know about and then we collect the ticketing revenue and then again same expenses because the expenses are usually hard costs so they're the same expenses that you'd have you put on a show when a promoter is is 
is presenting the show itself. So in this situation, again, it's exactly kind of like rental your skin, we're the promoter and we're the ones who are fully at risk. So your, your deal snapshot, you have your event income minus your talent shop, minus your talent costs, um, minus your expenses. And then that's the profit that the um, venue gets to take. Um, so I do see some questions coming in here. So I'm just going to answer those quickly. Um, so for the rental deal with a promoter, you as the venue only make revenue off the rental fee, rental fees and the promoter pays you rent out of the revenue. Correct. Yes. So we do not make any of the, the, let's say profit off the event. Um, if that makes sense. So the promoter is the one who's going to get the actual income from it we just we are just they're renting out the space so we get the rental fee um and then we up front pay the expenses and they kind of pay us back when we remit the um pr the profits to them if that makes sense um i do see one more question i'll grab real quick um based on your experience what would you say is the most stressful part of your profession and what are the actions you take to overcome the stresses within your profession um it so in ticketing in general, we'll get into this a little bit more later. Um, the, a lot of stress is on you, <laughs> especially being in the box office. Um, it's hard because you're the touch point. Um, you're the touch point between the, the clients that you deal with as promoters and also the general public that's buying tickets. Um, if there's a lot of times when a show goes on sale and um, I'm <laughs> right there at 10 a.m., Refresh, refreshing, checking, making sure everything works because it's, it's me. It's fully me. I'm the one who controls when it goes up, um, what it looks like and how it works in the ticketing system. So that is a little bit stressful. Um, I'm a complete preparer. I prepare, I triple check everything. And that's kind of the way that I deal with that. Um, that those are the most stressful times for me um, is during on sales or when something goes up to make sure it's as we agreed upon with the presenter. Um, so that's just how I deal with it. I just kind of get really focused in and checking through everything and, and you have to be very thorough in this kind of position. Um, so that's how I focus, how I deal with that. Okay, so let's look at the types of houses. So there's our, there are presenting houses and there are non-presenting houses. So most houses and most venues are going to be non-presenting houses. So that's where a lot of people are going to take those rental deals. Um, currently, I am in a, in a non-presenting house. So a lot of the time, it is the promoters who are at risk and the promoters who are calling shots. Um, again, the promoter is king. That's one thing I hope you guys remember, promoter is king. Um, in a presenting house, they are able to take risks. And those are kind of dictated out by the board and the founding interest that's our clients that we go that we report to. Um, as the management company. Um, so I did want to show, I, I'm just throwing in some really cool shots of some of our of ASM Global's venues. So this is the um, Colorado Convention Center in Denver, Colorado. This is really famous for that blue bear that you see that's looking into the windows. Um, I got to visit this building and I loved it. It was such a cool, a cool view and all those open glass. It was, it was amazing. Um, my, during my time in um, Reading, we, we would take risk occasionally. So I did have that um, experience under my belt as well. So let's talk about promoters. Um, so here are some of the, the logos from some of, the, uh, there's, uh, seems to be an endless stream of promoters that we work with. Um, but here's ones that we work with, Kurt, that we work with a lot. Um, you can't talk about promoters without talking about Live Nation. They definitely are one of the biggest around. Um, they run a lot of big national tours. Um, I work with them a lot currently. Um, Outback Concerts is great. AEG Presents is the promoter arm of AEG Facilities, which we merge with. Um, SLP Concerts, they're based out of New Jersey. Stan Levitstone's a great guy. Frank Productions, Round Room, um, NS2, they have been really great to us. We work with NS2 a lot. And then Nederlander National Markets, um, they also were another huge merger that came. It was Champ Theatricals and, and Nederlander that became Nederlander National Markets. Um, so that is um, a, a, a promoter that we work very closely with because uh, they present our Broadway series. Um, another question here, what would you make um, a venue be a presenting house versus a non-presenting house and why would they choose one or, or the other? So it, it is up to the the, the board or the, the interest that we're serving as client, that our clients that we're serving, um, they can choose whether they want to be at risk or not. So when when you're at risk, you have the opportunity to lose money as well as make. Um, so that's when your revenue coming in from ticketing is, is a lot lower than what your talent costs and your expenses 
are. So it's it's mainly of is there a possibility that you can lose some money um, being the venue um, and the promoter? It is the risk that you run, but you also open yourself up to the opportunity to gain. Um, so risk and reward being a non-presenting house means you're kind of always going to be on the plus side of things because you're just getting rent. You're an expense to the promoter. Um, the promoter has to then um, make up the profit in ticketing. So we, we don't worry about that as much. Now, again, we do try to take care of our, our promoters as much as we can and help them out. And if a show is not, you know, selling well, or it's not selling where they would like, we jump in and try to help out as much as possible. Um, so uh, there are a couple different types of clients. Um, so promoted events are you going to have where you have that promoter. Um, so those are the promoters that we've talked about before. They're also resident companies. Um, resident companies are impor extremely important to the work that we do. And these are companies that are going to be um, in the building a lot. Uh, a, a really good example is going to be a symphony. So um, a Reading Symphony or a Richmond Symphony. Um, there's, other, there's other ones that can be determined that. There's operas, um, different kind of plays that come through if it's, if it's a, a local organization that is presenting different musicals and things like that, and they're in your building a lot, they can be considered resident companies. So they're ones that are there all the time that you work with. Um, and then you also have what's called a tenant. So a tenant, um, a really good example of this is going to be in, in your backyard in um, Reading, Pennsylvania, is the Reading Royals. So the Reading Royals is a tenant to the building. They're someone who's in the building, they're working in the building, and they're there a lot. They take up a huge amount of the calendar because there's a giant piece of ice in the middle of the arena and they skate on it and play hockey. <laughs> um, so that, that's someone you can have as a tenant. It also includes like NFL teams. Sports teams are a really good example of someone who is, who is there, you know you're going to be committing a good amount of your calendar to. Um, this is the Bridgewater Hall in Manchester, United Kingdom. So I'm going to move on to who works at a venue and what are kind of the departments that that a venue encompasses. So um, there's the administration, booking, food and beverage, production, operations, ticketing, also known as box office, you'll hear people just call it box office, um, and marketing. Um, so, oh, sorry about that. So administration is going to include things like the general manager, the assistant general manager, um, HR, um, administrative tasks and duties. Um, booking is going to be your booking managers, directors, coordinators, food and beverage is going to be concessions, um, catering, things of that nature. Productions is going to be more of the live event aspect, so sound, lighting, stage, anything of that nature. Um, operations is more of the operations of the, of the venue, so those are the people that will go in and fix seats, uh, the janitorial staff, um, ticketing staff, or not, the ticket taker staff, the usher, stuff of that nature. Um, ticketing includes myself in the box office, um, and then marketing is going to be our staff that runs social media, helps out with marketing plans and promoters, um, anything that may be needed with that. All right, so workflow. Um, so I wanted to show from the beginning when an event gets booked, um, what happens from start to finish. So, and I also threw in what departments are working on that. So you guys can kind of have a good grasp of um, what departments or who's in, in the pot at whatever time. So the show's being booked. So the booking department's mainly going to ha handle that. They're going to be working with all those agents and promoters um, to try to get shows into the building. Um, they're also going to be working pretty closely with marketing and box office. Um, so that way, we can make sure they're going to ask for a scaling, which is a pretty much a, a breakdown of how the pricing looks for the event. Um, I do a lot of scalings when a promoter will reach out and say, "Hey, I'm thinking of bringing this artist. Um, you know, what do you think it would look like at these prices, or what what what's the gross going to be?" And, I, and I'll build out what the prices look, where the breaks are for them, so they can see it. Uh, marketing is going to be in touch with. We have these radio stations on hand. We have th these opportunities for you. There's this plan that we can make. Um, and then production, of course, is going to be interested in, you know, how do they bring, how does the show get brought into the venue? Is it, is it even possible? There are some times where a show is just too big. Now, we're very fortunate. We have a, a very large stage in both of our buildings in Richmond. Um, but there are some um, spaces that they want this show really bad, but your stage isn't tall enough because there's some kind of mechanical piece that needs to come in or something of that nature. Um, once the show is booked, it kind of gets handed off to, to marketing and box office. 
Um, and that's where the show is going to go into its pre-sale and on sales. So that's where I'll be working on the build. I'll be working directly with the promoter, um, the management, whoever needs, whoever the parties that are, are, have interest in it, I'll be working with them directly to make sure everything is set. Um, and then it goes into on sale. This also includes our marketing announcements and marketing plans. Um, and then once the show is on sale, it's kind of just in that on sale period. Um, it's, that's the period from when it announced, when you're first able to buy tickets, up until when the show is actually being performed. So there's a good amount of maintenance that I need to do, um, which is just checking inventory, managing the event in general. I'll get more into that later. So next we have the um, show, the show needs to be advanced. Um, so advancing a show is basically um, nailing down all the nitty gritty final details. Um, so that is mainly our uh, production is going to be involved in that. And then again, they touch base with um, food and beverage, finance and box office to make sure that if anything is needed, it is taken care of. Um, and this is where we have meetings where we, we go over just the whole events. So we have a sheet that lays out what time the band's coming in, what time security's getting there, what time ticket takers are coming through, um, what the stage is gonna look like, what time is intermission, what time these acts are going on, you know, how the entire event works, they will nail it down bit by bit, you know, even to the point of what time someone enters the building and when they leave. Um, and then after that, you're going to have the, the event load in. So with the event load in, that's actually where the show comes in. So that's when you see outside of our venues where we have you know, 15 tractor trailers loading in a Broadway show. Um, so they come in, that's going to be mainly handled by production, finance, um, food and beverage, again, to provide catering and other things that they may need. Um, and then um, box office too. There's other things I need to provide for them the day of or load in, or I usually will meet with every tour um, as soon as they come in. Um, we'll, we'll do what we call walking the house, um, where we'll walk the house and actually see everything. They get to see it in person. We can talk about it if there's any some issues or things that need to be handled. Um, I do see a question that just came in um, about uh, COVID-19. Um, I, I will answer that. I just wanna wait till the end um, to bring that up because it is kind of a, a large can of worms. Um, so next after loading, you have the actual performance. So when the performance is happening, you're going to have um, the, the production is gonna be mainly taken over because the show is on stage. <laughs> uh, box office, because we're there to serve the customers um, and make sure everyone's seated in, all the tickets are scanned, anything of that nature. Um, and food or beverage, because you need to grab a, a, a beverage and uh, maybe some snacks before you go into the show. Um, after the performance, there's, this, there's the loadout and settlement period. Um, so loadout is just production. It's doing everything in reverse. They back the trucks up and everything goes back into the truck and they move on to the next performance. Um, settlement is um, another process that's mainly handled between finance and box office. Um, that's a, a large part of my job. Um, so that is where we sit down with either the talent themselves or the promoter or the agents, whoever it is that's there as the um, best interest. And we will go over everything, dollars and cents, all the expenses. Here's, I, I provide a nice little packet of backup. Here's our contract. Go through everything so we can agree. Sign a piece of paper. Here's your checks. It's a great day. We look forward to seeing you um, next time. Um, so let's get into ticketing next. So now we have a, a large overview of, of the event. Um, and there is a lot of generalities, a lot of things that left out of there, but that's a basic idea of kind of how it moves forward. Um, so ticketing is more than just getting a, a butt in a seat. I, I do personally, before I stepped into ticketing, um, I was unaware of, of the, how complex it was. Um, and ticketing is something that is a, a very, you have to be a ticketing person to know it. Um, so it is a, a skill that's learned as you're in the industry. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who look at us to be people when they say something, marketing is brainstorming an idea, and I'm like, uh, the, you know, we got to do this in the system, we got to make it this way, or, you know, can you just word it this way so it's a little different? Um, it's a lot of just technical. There's a lot of times where I just get a call, and this is what we're thinking, is it possible? And I'm like, I'm not sure, but I will find a way to make it possible in this system. So let's do a quick um, overview of the department. So um, the ticketing department is gonna generally include the box office, which is going to be um, one of the, I guess, most forward facing ways to see the um, ticketing in general. So that's where we're going to deal with customers. We're going to deal with day-to-day um, -day sales um, and we're going to deal with um, building the events. Um, also encompassed under that is group sales. Um, 
we're fortunate enough to have a group sales department. Most buildings do have a group sales um, department. It may be separate of ticketing. Um, ours is actually lumped under it. It is a department that I directly oversee. Um, and then subscriptions as well. We are a very big Broadway house. Um, we, have a very, we have very successful Broadway seasons um, and subscriptions are a large part of that to have a subscriber base. Um, and I oversee subscriptions for um, ASM Richmond as well. Um, so I'm just seeing some questions come in here. Um, how do you manage all the duties you have to do the day of an event? Um, well, I have a, a full staff as well. Um, so there's a lot of times I need to be out of the box office. My office is directly in the box office. Um, so when, when events coming up, I have my staff who's taking care of it. I have some supervisors in there that have a little higher level clearance um, or will radio me, call me on my cell phone, be like, hey, this is a situation that pops up. I tell them what to do as I'm meeting with the tour and taking care of anything that they may need. Um, so it is kind of, like I said, promoter's king. Once the show's in, in the building, the show's in the building and they call my phone, I answer. Um, and, and I help them with anything that they may need. Um, so it is kind of just, I have some other staff that can help out with more of the basic, a customer's just walking up and they left their tickets at home and they need them reprinted ma manner while I'm dealing with, you know, here's what we're looking at in the house. Um, what POS system do you use for the box office? Is it proprietary? Does it link to food and beverage and merchandising? So I'm going to get into our ticketing system soon. Um, so we do have a ticketing system. Um, most ticketing systems are separate. Um, in, I, I wouldn't say it's proprietary because it is throughout the entire industry. Um, and it does not link to food and beverage or merchandising. They're on their own system. Um, there are a couple systems that will link up to it. Um, ours do not. Um, it's easier to keep that separate, if that makes sense. Um, because when I settle with a tour, we're talking about ticketing money. Um, we're not talking about what came in um, for beer sales. I um, don't know if I'm allowed to talk about beer on here, but you know that is a, a big part of our job for the beverage. Um, so we do keep that separate. There are some deals that we, we bring that in, but we just keep it separate as separate reports. Since I'm not directly overseeing it, I can't speak to how the merchandise went. I can speak to how the ticket sales went. And then there will be the, the merchandise representative that's there that usually already spoke to whoever's finance, who is settling the show in finance. Um, and then they have those questions answered as well. Okay. So let's, I wanted to give a quick overview of my department. Um, now this is different between different venues. So just to give you an idea of how it works um, for me in ASM Richmond. So um, uh, when I became the client service manager, this definitely looked a lot different. Um, or this definitely was different before then when I first joined as just the box office manager. Um, but we were able to bring in a lot of worlds and oversee a lot more now that I have that client services title. Um, so for me as a box office manager, I mainly oversee the Altria Theater. Um, and that includes our Broadway, because mainly at the Altria Theater. There's a separate um, box office manager for the Dominion Energy Center, um, which we call DEC. Um, and he manages the Dominion Energy Center. We do have an assistant box office manager, um, and these are full-time roles. Um, the assistant box office manager manages both buildings. Um, so they're an assistant to the Dominion Energy Center and the Altria Theater. Um, and the box office managers will co-manage that person, so we both oversee them. Um, so I receive the Altria Theater box office as the box office client services manager. I also see the subscriptions and group sales office. Um, we do have a full-time group sales coordinator um, who I receive as well in that position. And then the part-time group sales um, staff. And then there is the Altria Theater. We have a, a full-time box office coordinator. Uh, and then there's also the part-time ticketing staff. So this is just a quick view of how it is broken up in in my department, just so you can see it in kind of person, in, in, in a real life scenario of how it works out. There's other theaters that they, they work differently. Um, they have different organization structures, but I did just want to give kind of ours. So let's talk about the build. Um, so the build is a huge part of my job. Um, so the build is the ticketing letter. So the ticketing letter is kind of my contract when it comes to ticketing services. Um, it's addition to the contract, and a lot of what's on the contract is mirrored in, in that build. Um, it's my kind of just document I focus on. It's, it's my Bible. We have a promoter who calls there. It's the Bible uh, because that's the importance of it. Um, that details out everything ticketing-wise, and it also details out a lot of finance-wise, how um, the different revenue splits go, how everything looks to the customers. It's, it's a very important document. Included in there is going to be things like holds. Um, so you guys may have seen um, 
that used before. Um, holds are seats that are, are held back from sale for a very specific reason. So the biggest um, example I have of that is marketing. So when we build a show, we know that we're going to give 10 tickets to um, this radio station. They're gonna give them away to help promote the show. So those seats are held. Um, and there's a couple different ways we do that. We, I can either just pull them and give them them seat, those seats, or they'll send me a list of, you know, these five people want two seats each, and I'll have them waiting at will call for them. Um, so that is the, the biggest um, kind of example of what a hold is. Pricing is huge because, again, that detail, that lists out the gross of how the show is going to work financially. Um, on-sale schedule is really important. What seats are going on sale when um, and to who. And what I mean by to who, I mean there's pre-sales. There's a lot of artists, as you guys know from buying tickets to shows, there's artists who do have um, pre-sales, um, whether that be through Spotify, whether it be through a Facebook group, email list. They want to make sure their fans get in first and get some great seats. So they use that for pre-sales and then the on-sale for the general public. Um, any other offers they may be throwing in there, um, there's a lot of PBS offers that come through shows that work with PBS to help them raise money locally um, or anything like, uh, you know, if there's um, some kind of, I know Ticketmaster is, is a, a popular program called um, Me Plus Three. Um, so there's other like different ticketing offers that come through there or if they want to say, okay, students get half price tickets. So if you have a student ID, you get a half price ticket. Those kind of things will be included in there as well. Um, and then there's also going to be contacts. Um, these are the general people that I'll be working with and talking to to make sure um, they have everything they need from me. And by me, I mean the venue as well. Um, and then counts. Counts are really important. Um, there's another report we'll talk about in a little bit that has um, just kind of how everything's laid out. So counts, they just want to know how many people bought, what price did they buy at, what's my money right now? That's what they're looking for. And usually they want that on a daily basis. Um, so there's an automated weighing system that I can send them a, a report that shows them that. Um, so I have a bunch of questions. I love that you guys are asking questions. You're getting ahead of me in my presentation here. Um, so I do see one about um, scalping tickets. Um, I'm gonna get to that shortly. Um, and my favorite part of the job, um, my favorite part of the job, honestly, is just seeing the crowd come in. Um, I love when I, I can see them leave and they're talking about how excited they were and how great of a time it was. Um, I do think it's hard a lot of times being in a customer service position with the, the, the general public that comes in, we do kind of tend to focus on the negative or the complaints we get. Um, but there's also, you know, thousands of people that leave that are so stoked, they're so excited, and they want to come back to our theater, and they, they love coming to our theater because we bring great shows, and we're right here in Richmond with them. Um, so that's kind of my favorite thing, is just to see how excited they get. It's really cool, too, for um, children's shows. Um, kids come dressed up like the characters. Um, which is the coolest thing in the world. Um, so it's just really excited to see people get to experience something they can only experience in our building, which is amazing. Um, so moving forward here. Um, so maintaining the show. So the building is in a unique experience. Um, and my position is in a unique experience as well. Oh, real quick, I forgot to mention, I've been missing out on mentioning the buildings here. So this is the Coca-Cola Arena and that's in Dubai. That's one of the ones in our portfolio as well. Um, and then here we have the um, Hawaii Convention Center in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, I, <laughs> I have not visited that one. I would love to because um, I've heard amazing things about it. Um, but maintaining an event. Um, so there's a lot of things I do to maintain it because we're in a unique position where I have to service the show and the promoter and service the building, but I also have to take care of the market here. Um, so that's the unique position we're in, where we have the market that we need to take care of, and that's the customers, the, the client base. If somebody calls in and there's there's you know accident in the family, they need some kind of assistance or something, we're we're, we're there for them. Um, there's a lot of times where um, to throw an example, I'm not going to use the name of the show, um, but there was some show there was a show where there was a very small amount of VIP tickets, um, and they particularly wanted the VIP to be in the front row. It was called a part of the front row the front row package. Um, and there was a customer who uh, needed ADA um, accommodations, um, and the seats just were not in a place where those ADA uh, accommodations could be um, handled appropriately. Um, so I had reached out to the tour and said, hey, I have this customer, there's two of them. Um, I know we're only allowed to sell like let's the six of the, those front row VIPs. Um, would you mind if we, if we move that up to eight? So I can sell them to the VIPs in a section where they're able to sit um, and enjoy the show. 
Um, Mo shows, I mean, that show was like, yes, of course, thank you for reaching out to us. Um, Mo shows will 100% say yes to that. I can't think of a show that wouldn't. Um, and those are the kind of things you need to do to take care of the, of the, the client base. Um, but also, like I keep saying, promoter is king. So there's other things that need to service the show and make sure the show is still happy. So if a customer calls in, they want a refund for something, we're not able to make that call because it's not our show. We're not at risk for it. So I do need to get approval from a promoter. Am I able to release these tickets? Am I able to give them a refund? Yes or no. And those can kind of go um, either way. So um, I'm just going to hop in real quick and answer a couple more questions. Uh, I see one. Um, has a show, has there ever been a scenario where an event has been double booked without anyone realizing it? Um, no, we have a lot of safeguards in place to present that uh, or prevent that. Um, we have we have a whole system um, and that's something that I, I could be dived deep, more deeply into with the booking aspect of it. Um, but there's a thing called holds on the booking on the booking side. Um, a first hold, second hold, there's different, different things. So it's kind of, you get the first shot at that date. Um, so if you confirm you're, you're the first one there, you, you got it. Um, so there's, there's a lot of internal checks we have to make sure shows um, aren't double booked, if that makes sense. Um, with the merger with ASM, with SMG and ASM, were there any changes with your position and um, how was the adjustment? Actually not. Um, the a ASM has been incredible to me um, throughout my entire career. I'm very thankful for ASM. Um, and it was great because um, they saw the opportunity for these great two companies to merge. And honestly, the only thing that has changed since then um, has been some smaller internal policies and also just that we expanded and got more buildings, they got more buildings. Um, so it was a win-win for everybody. Um, and there's been nothing real change to my process or anything of that nature. Um, so Let's move forward here. Um, so now we're at settlement. <laughs> I have reports, baby, because that is my job. Reports, reports, reports. Um, so an audit is one of the biggest reports you'll hear anybody in, in ticketing talk about. Um, audits are huge. Audits are kind of what I live by. Um, and that's that report that kind of details out, you know, what tickets were sold, when, how it was kind of set up, what are the price levels. Um, so that's one that's really important to shows. So you'll hear audit thrown a lot, around a lot in ticketing and live events. Um, the counts are audit reports. That's what they get. Um, method of payment is huge too. Um, there's a lot of uh, times where you need to know how people bought tickets. Um, let's say for credit card service fees. You need to know how many people bought credit cards because the credit card company gets a, a fee. Um, and that's for any retail organization that uses credit cards. They have to, they have to pay some service fees for that. Um, there's also all kinds of different ones. There's literally a never ending list. Um, when I worked with Ticketmaster in Reading, um, you had to have a lot of them memorized. Um, with eTix, there's a lot of different options, which is what I use now in Richmond, Pennsylvania, or uh, Richmond, Virginia, sorry. Um, so there's uh, endless amounts of reports. There's reports to kind of get you to do anything you want to do. Um, there's a lot of times I get a call and it's just some real obscure question. And it's like, can you find this out? I'm like, give me about 20 minutes. And I'm pulling all kinds of reports and merging Excel sheets and, um, all kinds of things to, to, to get whatever information they need because the, the, the shows just want information out of you. Um, so this is the Peoria Civic Center in Peoria, Illinois. Um, that's a beautiful venue. I've not been there um, either, but that's just one that I wanted to pick out and, and show you guys. Um, next, and this is one of those questions that was brought up earlier, was the ticketing POS system. So there's a lot of ticketing companies um, out there um, here are the really big ones, um, and the the biggest one definitely would have to be Ticketmaster. Um, I'm not going to say it's an industry standard, but most buildings have Ticketmaster as a ticketing system. When I was in um, Reading, we used Ticketmaster. I had experience um, with Ticketmaster and building shows in Ticketmaster. Um, here in Richmond, Virginia, we are very fortunate to work with eTix. Um, eTix is a, a great company that we use here. Um, there's also uh, Tesla Tora, which is going to be mainly for like nonprofit use. Um, I, I shouldn't say mainly for nonprofit use, but there's a CRM, which is a, a client relationship management built into it. Um, so it's great for nonprofits and it's really popular in those systems. Um, and Eventbrite is a really big one. Um, they just absorbed, I think it was uh, Ticketfly. Um, they absorbed from them, so they became Eventbrite. So these are kind of the, the, the big guys in the industry. Um, and again, I have had experience with Ticketmaster um, and eTix. Um, 
So uh, I see some more questions. I'll get to these in a second, I promise you guys. Um, you are still trying to get a little bit ahead of me here. Um, so th and this was one of the questions I was asked earlier about scalping. Um, there are resellers, and these are ticket companies that resell tickets that were already bought. So the big thing about this is to know primary versus secondary ticketing. So a primary ticket ticket servicer is Ticketmaster, eTix, um, any of those companies that originate with the venue. So I directly am the pr a primary ticket seller because we sell the tickets. The only way you can get a valid ticket in Richmond, Virginia is through um, eTix. Now these resellers will be on the secondary market. So they are selling these tickets after they've already been sold through the primary ticket seller. Um, so StubHub is prop definitely the biggest one in the game for resale tickets right now. Um, and then their SeatGeek and Vivid Seats are really big as well. So what these people do, um, again, some of you may have purchased from them, they allow me as a consumer to buy a ticket from someone else. So it's a secondhand transaction that is separate of the um, original purchase place, the primary ticketing and the venue. Um, so that does, that does create some challenges. Um, and that does create some issues to the venue. So, um, one of the big issues is, is a pricing issue. Um, I mean, it is scalping, it's, it's, it's modern in scalping. There's a lot of people who will buy a front row seat to um, whatever a, a big ticket item is, and then they'll try to sell it for four or five times what it's worth. Um, it, it is really hard because there are people out there um, who do not understand the difference, um, and they will just search uh, for an event or search on Google for a, a theater or a venue, and they'll be the, one of the first hits they get is for a stub hub and they don't realize they're buying it secondhand. Um, and that causes a lot of issues because if we have a customer who wants to buy, um, let, let's say uh, a Jonas Brothers concert um, and they go and they search Jonas Brothers, R uh, Richmond, Virginia or whatever venue or market they're in and they see tickets are a thousand dollars. They're like, wow, the Jonas Brothers is way more expensive than I thought I can't afford to go. But really, tickets weren't a thousand dollars. They they bought those tickets for you know eighty bucks up in the top of the balcony. Um, so it, it kind of helps. It hurts our perception of tickets and the perception of the artist because these people are just trying to make um, the highest margin off of those tickets that they can after they buy them. Um, it also creates an ownership issue, which is a, a a weird thing to think about unless you are involved in the industry here. So the an ownership issue comes into play when um, let's say me myself, uh, Trent Gray. I buy a ticket and then I go on StubHub, which I would never do, just a quick disclaimer, never do that, and resell a ticket to somebody else. And AJ Merlino buys that ticket. When AJ Merlino shows up to the venue um, and he's like, oh, I don't have my ticket. Here's my order number. Can you print it for me? Well, you don't have a ticket. Um, your name's not in our ticket system. Um, well, yeah, I did. I bought a ticket right here. Well, oh, that's, that's from StubHub. Um, you're a customer of StubHub. Um, it's hard because you're not a customer of, of the venue or a customer of us. And a lot of people have a hard time understanding that. Um, and especially in those in that, those situations, you spent five times what the ticket was worth. You're being turned away at the gate because you don't have a ticket. Or, hey, I, I was told the tickets would be emailed to me and they never did. They're not there. There's also been some issues where if a customer comes in and there's someone in their seats. Um, well, it's because those people actually own the seats and then they sold them to you and got their money's worth. And unfortunately, um, legally, they are still the owner of those seats. They're the ones that get to experience it. Um, and you kind of have to take it up with StubHub, which is, is a really hard thing customer service wise. Um, and that's one of the things I'm seeing with the unexpected challenges. Um, that's one of the really hard challenges that pops up is to have someone, you know, my heart breaks when someone's in my, in my lobby and I'm out talking to them. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but your tickets aren't real. Um, and that's another thing with the fraudulent tickets. And it, it, it's, you can laugh at it at the time, but it's hard when you really think about it. Because when someone walks up to a show and they try to scan a ticket and it doesn't scan and they're like, oh, hey, get Trent involved. And I walk out there and the name on the ticket says Daffy Duck. Um, it's, it's hard. And you think, how could people get by that? But it does happen more than you would think for people just selling tickets because they know it's a hot item and they know people want to buy them and they can get them on StubHub and, and, and it's, you know, or, or I don't want to stick off StubHub or other secondary markets um, where they can, they can do that since it's not checked through the venue. It's not venue approved. It's not venue verified. Um, there's no way to know those seats are verified or real. Um, a lot of the verified um, claims are going to be to get your money back, if that makes sense. 
Um, so not a, your seat will work, we'll, we'll give you a refund from those providers, which is, is a hard situation. And, you know, not the same when you just, you know, told your, your son, you're going to see Hamilton today with me, you know, it's, it's a hard, it's, it's a hard situation to be in. Um, and I hope <laughs> one hard thing, and I will just give a, a, a quick shout out is please use your primary ticketing um, providers, call the menus if you're unsure if it's a primary ticket provider, um, because you will get that the assurance from them like I, there's been people that have called them like i'm seeing these tickets on you know citytickets.com it's like no, no no go to etix that's where you need to be um and i feel so good for helping them out and getting them out of that kind of weird situation um because you do kind of run a risk when you buy from a second hand site um so hopefully that's answered some of the questions that come in about challenges um and and different things of that nature um so let's look at some of the so that's some of the other outcomes of secondary markets versus primary markets is finding the true value of a seat, as weird as that sounds, um, that is kind of some discussions that are happening in the ticketing world of, okay, we're selling this ticket for, you know, $120 um, and they're selling like hotcakes on a resale site for $350. That ticket may actually be worth $350, but it's a balancing act. So you've got, you got to watch because um, the scalpers are always trying to make more money than what they paid. So if you give into that too much and you're like, okay, let's raise our ticket price $50, um, you're going to see the ticket price go up $50 on the resale site. Um, so, so it is a kind of a metric to look at, but you know, not take as seriously as possible just to see what it is. And there have been some tours and companies, they do re really religiously check resale sites to kind of find the value of the ticket because that, as in a booking perspective, you are trying to find the value of a ticket. You're trying to find what a customer will pay to have that great seat in the front of the arena. Um, it is also an alternative to refunds. Some people do just go there instead of getting a refund. Um, you know, take that as, as you will. Um, but there are some companies, um, Ticketmaster comes to mind, who do run their own resale alongside of their primary ticketing. Um, in that situation, it is really safe to buy it. Um, you, I would take context <laughs> in, into that situation because we do have people who buy resale tic sites off tic uh, tickets off Ticketmaster come to our venue, which is eTix, and they're not as safe because it's it's a totally different system. Um, so that is that is a, a different alternative that could come from a, a, a secondary market. Um, it also is a large industry, um, which is why you're seeing some companies like Ticketmaster dip their toes into it <laughs> to make sure, you know, to try to get that missed revenue as well. Um, this is the Mercedes-Benz Superdome in New Orleans, um, which is a really cool venue. Um, so I want to get into the bigger picture here. Um, so just kind of the, the bigger picture of what a venue is and, and where it's going to be and, and its role in the industry. So again, the venue has such a unique position um, because we're the front facing aspect of the show of the show. Um, there are the majority of the public don't really understand what a promoter is or understand that there is a promoter involved or another interest that's there that's actually putting on the show. Um, there's a lot of times that somebody will call me and ask me a question or ask for ask for an accommodation of some sort. I'm like, okay, well, getting checked the show. Oh, but you are the show, like you're the one putting it on. Oh, you know they rent the space from us. That's how it works. We got to go back to them for their input and their decision on this. Um, so we're in a unique position. Um, there's also some times where that, you know, if a show cancels, it's negative on the venue. It's not negative on the artist um, or anything of like that. Not saying it should be, but there, we have a unique position where we need to deal with the, the community that's buying tickets in our market. We need to protect our market to make sure they're not getting price gouged, make sure they're not um, having bad experience with scalping to make sure they're, they're being taken care of when they can because that's our market and then also to take care of the promoter who's coming through because we, we want their business we want to keep them coming back and we want to keep serving them um, so venues are in a really cool spot it's also just I, I'm very thankful for my position in my job um, I get to see concerts <laughs> sometimes every day for a week it's it's amazing the the amount of concerts plays um, sporting events and things I have been to because I, I, I'm being paid to be there, which is extremely incredible. Extre I'm so thankful for it. I, I saw so many concerts and shows before I was working professionally in the industry. Um, I mean, that number is 
gone up by 10 since I've, I've worked in the industry. Um, and I've seen acts that I, I, I can never afford to go see before. Um, and it's just incredible to be in that experience. Um, sometimes it's stressful. Sometimes it's, it's, it's really hard. Um, but when you're in a room with, you know, 7,000 people who are all screaming and cheering, or you're seeing one of your favorite artists on your stage, um, it's a, a really cool feeling. And one of the cool things too, in, in our industry is, um, you know, when, when I was, before I became a professional in it, um, I would brag about the shows I saw. I'd be like, oh yeah, I, I saw so-and-so here. I saw this show there. I was, I was at that one. Um, you know, now essentially people kind of, you know, brag about who comes in our buildings, <laughs> you know? Yeah. We had, we had that person come in on this date. Um, we had this purple here. Those people are great to work with. Um, it's a, it's a, a really cool experience to have that. So um, lastly, I have questions and you guys have a lot of them here. So I'm just going to try to um, start knocking through them. Um, some of them I have already answered. So sorry if you guys have felt a little ignored. I don't mean to do that at all. Um, so um, the knowledge you're using your job, do you feel you learned it at Albright while taking the classes or more while on the job or just by doing the job? Um, I heard you also majored in the arts. So did you, um, did that help as long with the music industry major? Um, yes, it did. Um, I will be honest. Um, I was not as prepared as other graduates coming into the industry um, for um, my line of work. Um, I did learn a lot of it on the job. Um, and that's why I did kind of feel it was really important to go over kind of the live, uh, the whole overview of the event for you guys. So you, so you guys did have that. Um, Albright does prepare you for a lot of it and gives you a great overview of the industry. Um, like I said before, my time at WXCC was incredible to have that um, experience that really helped me as I moved on. Um, and I also majored in arts administration um, with David Tanner, who was absolutely incredible. And I, I learned a lot from um, professionally as well as personally. Um, I, I was very fortunate to have a lot of great mentors in my life um, and still moving forward, even professionally with an ASM um, at, and at Albright, um, who have really helped and shaped you know, what, I, what I've become. Um, as, as a graduate of Albright, um, how did you handle the transition from college to career? And what are some of the successes and failures that you overcame? Also, you mentioned your cat. Um, he's the best cat in the world. Um, but how's your aquarium doing these days? Thank you very much for mentioning that. Um, so the transition is a little hard. It is hard for some people. Um, I think it's, it was easier for me because I was working part-time during my, my time at Albright there at the venue. Um, but it's just a weird thing. Um, I, and you're not around your friends a lot more. You can't just walk to the campus center and, and see a lot of people, which I know a lot of, of everyone is kind of experiencing now. Um, but it is, it is a little bit of a hard transition, but you do kind of get used to it. Your relationships mean a lot more when you know you have to put a lot of effort into them and your everybody else has put a lot of effort into them too, because everyone has a lot going on. Um, I'm very bad at texting. I'm very bad at keeping in touch with people. Um, but when I get a text from a friend I haven't talked to in a while, I, I love that. And I, and I think about them. I think about the friendship we have and I talk to them and catch up. Um, I'm, a, I'm a very kind of a person where, you know, I, we cannot talk for a year and we're still as good friends as we were the last time we talked. Um, so that's, that is some hard for some people to deal with. Um, I did want to touch on the COVID-19. Um, so, so COVID-19 is kind of crazy, um, with everything going on right now. Um, we are one of the really the heavier hit industries with COVID. Um, and it does kind of cause a lot of uncertainty, um, because, you know, in, in my, my state now in, in Virginia, the governor declared, um, no groups of 10 or more, um, which, if you've been to a concert, it's a little bit more than 10. Um, it is a pretty lame mosh pit. There's only nine people in it. <laughs> um, so it, uh, it, it does affect us a lot, but we've been working extremely hard the last couple of weeks to get dates moved, to get customers taken care of, and to make sure everything is, is going as planned. Um, I do see that AJ joined in. Do you want me to keep taking questions here or you know, pause for now? Actually, during our, uh, our Q&A in the panel discussion, we can rehash these questions. Thanks, everyone, so much.